Hey guys, Derek here with On the Horizon Podcast. Welcome to this week's episode. This week, we're going to be looking back at a podcast that we recorded back during hunting season with writer Sean Utley, with engineer at Hornady Ryan Damon, and with RGM Trooper Kruger and myself down at the ranch in South Texas. We cover a lot of cool stuff, a lot about the 22 Cree, more new products, some really cool stuff on bullet design and how bullets fly that I think you'll really like. Hope you enjoy this week's episode. Here we go. fun to kind of bring it down to the ranch and get out of the studio and do something a little bit different so right on so well guys i appreciate you being on the podcast and we're going to start here we'll just we'll just keep yep. going so i think what best way to do we'll go around the room and introduce everybody um that way we can figure out how we ended up here okay <laughs> awesome. so yeah. obviously i'm Derek ratliff um founder of horizon firearms and uh, i'll pass it over to you sean uh sean utley freelance contributor i have been so since 2008 nice uh hornady is uh Invited me out on this hunt, which I'm grateful for. Yeah. Um, just great group, just a great group of guys. So I really like working with them. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. I'm Ryan Damon. I'm an engineer at Hornady. I have been for about 11 years now. I do a lot on bullet bullet design stuff. So that's kind of my background and how I ended up here. If you want to get to that? Yeah, uh, yeah. A lot of the 22 cal stuff you guys shoot. I had hand in working on early on so yeah, i think we can pretty much say that without you helping on the inside on the 22 creed more we probably wouldn't be here with the 22 creed more honestly yep. so that's been a that's been <laughs> that's a long way, project yeah way too much credit there i don't <laughs> think i did much but <laughs> you're, you're at least like hey these guys yeah. are doing stuff yeah. and we've been yeah. shooting the 80x bullets for yeah shoot, i don't know years now so that was uh, five years ago <laughs> Five years ago, we made the first one, oh, almost six now. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? February of 18, because I remember having the boxes back on the shelf before we started running full production. It took five years to get that thing turned around finally. So, uh, wow. But anyway. Wow. Uh, I'm Trooper Kruger, and I'm a general manager at Horizon. So I'm, I'm the new guy to the group here. I mean, <laughs> you've all been in your, in your journeys on your space, in the space for a while, and uh, I joined the team at Horizon uh, over the summer this year, uh, coming from unrelated industry. So I'm... I'm excited to be here and just helping us as we launch 22 Creed more yeah. uh, and build up from within so we can get these rifles in people's hands. Nice. I think, so we'll start with, I want, I want to start with 22 Creed and we'll get us all loosened up here and then we'll go. Kind of <laughs> other stuff. So obviously, um, you know, running on the 22 Creed more this week, doing some whitetail hunting and getting out of the range, some Havelina and stuff. So just overall, you know, this week we're shooting a left-handed Vandal X, and we'll put some pictures of that, and also doing a little bit with our new uh, Venatic Carbon and uh, the new Wombat Action, so getting getting a little trigger time on those. I want I want unfiltered opinion on the guns that you've had at the range. So you've, you've reviewed, so for viewers, you review a ton of stuff. Oh, right? yeah. Lots. Yeah. So I don't, I don't even know where to begin with well, that. Well, let's, let's start oh. with... If um, I'm going to say this, if you've read Guns and Ammo, maybe. Oh yeah. Yeah. So I, like, I, which which articles have you been in? Well, I mean, I've worked with just about every publishing company. I can honestly say the only space I haven't been in is re, in is Recoil. Okay. Uh, though I know the guys there and I have for years. I just got to a point where I would only work with certain publishers just to keep my workload manageable. Yep. So I, you know, you could. Because I'm freelance, I could work for anyone I want to, but I many years with Outdoor Sportsman's Group, which are guns and ammo. So I can't tell you how many covers I photographed, how many articles I used to do. Um, what they call uh, what is it? Um, special interest publications. So Book of the AR-15, uh, their Precision Magazine, all those different things. I used to do tons of work in there, those. So I'd do covers, and sometimes I'd photograph the entire magazine, write. 70 or 80 percent of the articles stuff like that so it it's so, deep and, and it's it's about deep this in the deer stand a little bit i thought it was interesting how you got into this space yeah. so like you didn't the way i understand you didn't really grow up hunting growing up in this space and, and then all of a sudden like now you're he's like freelance right. writer yeah. for the major right. publications but trying to connect with how that happened so my dad had guns i, I always liked guns and he'd always tell me not to touch them and i would always you know when no one was around uh, I had a friend when we were young, like 13 years old. My friend had an Uzi, 
Oh, then man. you know he, he he was just that kid. <laughs> so I was really into them then, um, and it was just something I held through working in corporate America, and I could spend my time going to classes and stuff. So I did tons of classes from let's say 2005 to 2011 or 12. We would spend our summers going to pistol AR classes and things like that before I got into precision. Uh, photography was a hobby. One day I said, I'm going to take pictures of my guns and show people. And that's pretty much how it started. That's that's, cool. that's what got me to this space. That's awesome. Man. Yep. Well, I appreciate it too. If you're on this podcast, big help in getting all this set up outside <laughs> of a studio. So definitely, definitely uh, got it going on the, on that, that side of things. So back to, back to on the 22 cream. So tell me the good and bad. What do you think? What do you think? I mean, I don't, I don't really know because yeah. it's funny because I shoot so much precision rifle and I'm a big six millimeter fan, yeah. you know, so a lot of six millimeter, six five, well, there's Dasher, GT, Creedmoor, six five Creedmoor, 308, all those different things. Yeah. I would read things about the 22 Creedmoor, see it in places, but I, I don't know if I realized it was a real thing, Yeah. right? I always thought it was the wildcat chase and I'm like, I'm not going to worry about that until yeah. I can buy it in a factory box and do my thing because I don't have time to reload. Yep. Right. Dude, so, that's a, and that's great feedback because I, I think that's what we're. Seeing no, it's a huge thing for board. me. Yeah. It's it's huge for me, and I'm I'm man enough to admit that I think reloading is cool, but I don't want to spend time doing it. <laughs> I, I will saying. never I will never debate the results you get. Right. I, yeah. Yes, yeah. I get it, but I don't have the time, nor do I want to take the time to do what it ne- what I need to do yeah. to get it where it needs to be. Yeah. Because I got other things I want to do. Yep. Yeah. Now that said, um, I shot the 22 Creedmoor in Idaho a couple months ago oh, at, at an event. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, okay, I didn't know it was real. And <laughs> I just remember shooting, you know, we start at 200 yards just because that's what they do. And then I'm like, well, let's go out to five or six. And it was just shooting so flat and easy. No recoil, no drama. Yep. And I'm a big 223 fan. So I like that type of that yep. 22 caliber feel and shooting. And it was solid. And I didn't know you could come out here with 80 grain bullet and kill stuff. I thought that was like absolute no no. Yeah. So I'm stunned by it. It's phenomenal. Well, we didn't, and, and this week we didn't even have the, I wish we'd have had the X ammo. It came like just a little bit behind mm-hmm. for this hunt. I think you would see a huge difference on the whitetail side in the X. So we were doing all this with M's, which is pretty mm-hmm. impressive to me. It's just the speed on the thing yeah. is. It's yeah. awesome and great, great for kids. But so you mentioned this. I want to get this point. I think it's really cool too. So you have done a ton in the shooting and tactical side, mm-hmm. but that this is really this is your first whitetail go. It is. It is a uh, lot of antelope. I've been to Africa, hunted, done all sorts of things. Yeah. Even a bear before a whitetail. <laughs> this is my you first. Did it in the reverse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This like, is yeah. my uh, first uh, whitetail, um, and uh, again. 80 grain bullets. I, people poo poo all over the 6.5 Creedmoor at 100 and whatever grain, right? Like 143, the ELDX, right? Like, yeah, oh, yeah. you can't do that. I'm like, okay. And then you're telling me we're shooting stuff with 80 grainers. Yeah. And I'm like, that's probably not right. <laughs> Ryan, to that point, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, you, you're big up <laughs> Yeah, we could go. I could talk a long time about the uh, match bullet hunting thing because yeah, coming from my end, so, yeah, I mean, there's so many different directions I can go. Yes, you can kill animals with it, but there is, there's limits, right? Like, Texas whitetails are not Saskatchewan whitetails right. and uh, elk. And there's different, different animals take different bullets to kill them. But for deer-sized game, antelope-sized game, 22 Creedmoor is legit. And I, told, I tried telling guys that worked that, I mean, six yeah, years six ago years now. <laughs> Especially when we made the X bullet, yeah. Man, this having that firsthand experience shooting it into a ballistics gel and getting to do that testing, it's like, ah, this is actually a legitimate cartridge and bullet here. Yeah. And I remember, uh, I think we were shooting the 88s, like the first 88s we did. And that kind of lined up with when we were first doing that, the gun you guys built and sent us for a test lone yeah. gun. I was laying out if we had done that as a factory offering at the time, it would have been the flattest shooting offering period across any ammo we made Isn't that crazy? like yeah you can <laughs> soup up stuff hand load other stuff and beat it but we could be in legit sammy pressures here and it'd be flat as shooting out to a thousand That's easily 
Yeah, and so if you think about it, if that had happened five years ago, even three years ago, right before yeah. COVID, what the difference would have been just in terms of momentum been crazy. So I do want to hit back on the match, Gary, because I know we've talked about this a lot, and it seems like that is like on the podcast, that is the hottest uh, topic. So, you know, where do you – let's start with, from the real bullet guy, what is really the difference between the X and the M? I mean, there's a lot of – like people say, oh, it's this, or oh, it's that, or you can do this, or that. What is the true difference between those two bullets? So I'll – go a step further back and kind of describe what makes a bullet expand. Okay. And at what point do we design a bullet that has expansion characteristics? So that separate, separates like boat to hollow points, a traditional match bullet, open tip match, boat to hollow point, whatever you can call it, HPBTs. Uh, there's nothing there other than a lead core and a jacket wrapped around it. No mechanism for expansion initiation, right? The only thing you can rely on is that bullet to upset and tumble and come apart, fragment, because there's no reliable mechanism to start anything there. So that's why you hear stories of people have great results with boat to points, dropping elk at unheard of ranges, like high shoulder shots, and oh, to boat to point, that thing's awesome hunting bullet. And then you other, hear other times where the FMJ, like an arrow, straight through an antelope and it runs 300 yards and it takes an hour to die. Been there. That's when we started shooting the uh, the uh, seven by six five yeah. BRC after we're shooting the one forties in the boat tail hollow point. That was a game changer in my head. I saw that happen and had it on film was the craziest thing. Like I didn't miss this deer. You can see it go through and hit the dirt behind. But there's it. no it's reaction. Wild. Yeah, it's wild. Yeah, you see that we did a lot early on ELDX testing, shooting everything we could find in, in gel, just to compare it to, and BTHPs in gel. It's a complete roll of dice. Like, you break stuff in the lab because it's zinging out, tumbles and zings out, might go up, might go down, might come apart, might blow up right away. <laughs> so that's why we always tell people, you, those aren't hunting bullets. Hmm. We don't recommend it. So moving towards the ELD match, that it, the bullet construction is very similar, other than we're putting a tip in the front of it. So there's no... We don't design any jacket thickness profile to give us any terminal results. We draw that jacket as good as we can for consistency and accuracy. We want those bullets to shoot as best as we can all the time. And hunting bullets, you can design in all the expansion characteristics that you want. Interlock rings that hold cores in the jacket. Uh, thickness changes as you move up towards the nose. All that times types of things. That that makes a big difference on what that bullet does when it hits a medium. So that's why, from a manufacturing, a bullet manufacturer standpoint, we don't ever tell people, like, yeah, you should go hunt with the LD match. So does because the match it's, do it's the not same thing in gel as just a straight boat to hall point where it's just... No, anywhere? no. A um, ELD match in gel, you actually have that tip for to initiate that expansion. It sets back in the jacket, moves that lead out of the way, starts moving the jacket out of the way, and it does it consistently because that tip's always there, right? So... It's just at what rate it does that. The jacket's so much thinner that jack the tip sets back so fast. That's like what a VMAX is, right? It just it does it so fast, the bullet's so like going so fast that it just boom, it explodes. You want to explode within eight inches of entrance. So what's really interesting to me is like for the 22 Creedmoor is like the only round, correct me if I'm wrong, that where you've got the ELDM and the ELDX are at the same grain weight. So everywhere else, you've yeah. got, like, if you're in 6 mil, you've got, like, 103s yes. versus 108s, you know, and, and so on. And so this yep. creates, like, a really unique where, from a consumer standpoint, there can, may even be, like, a, hey, which one, are they really the same? Because from the outside, we talked earlier on the outside, they're the same, right? They look right. the same profile. That is, yeah, we talked about that earlier a couple of days, in the past few days. Because uh, at the time, Complete transparency. At the time, I didn't know it was going to be a product. Like, we didn't know if we were going to launch it. Yeah. We made some because, hey, 22 Creedmoor might, might be a thing. And this is 2016, 17. Yeah. It's like, man, 22 Creedmoor might be a thing. And it was at the same time as Valkyrie. Mm -hmm. it's like, oh, oh, it can take this long head height bullet. We can make pretty big, B, pretty high BC 22s now. Okay, make the OJF on the 88s. Well, we already had the 80 AMAX, which turns into 80 ELD match. It's like, ah, oh, that's probably a good enough profile to put on this ELDX. Let's just do that for now, and let's make it the same. <laughs> and, and, and it turns out, yes, externally they are within, I don't know, 
because the jacket's thicker on the ELDX, it makes to make the same way. It's longer, right? Because copper's yeah. less dense than lead. Uh, but it's like twenty thou longer. Other than that, boat tail the same, OJ the same, same Dude, tip. And I love it like that. And it's it's crazy. And I know it's probably not the right, right, right way to advertise it. And it probably is not exactly the same. But when we tested on the first round and went out all that hunting, we literally like set the gun up for the match, and then we're just switching mag to mag. Like, okay, we shoot this one with this shoot this one with this and using the same dope out to like 500 yards and it was virtually in, in, indifferent mm -hmm. yeah. and uh for for guys down here for me i'm like i know it's weird on the production setting but i'm like this is amazing because i'm like i'll go shoot coyotes tonight and shoot a deer tomorrow and and not have to yeah. mess with the gun a lot and so i think it added some for me i was like this is great well, that's what i like about <laughs> it too is that you know i have one profile um so i, I do use the hornaday app but i have one profile and even though I know both bullets are in there, like there's no material difference at any ranges that I shoot. And so yeah. I just have one profile, and it doesn't matter yeah. what you're running at, at that point. But I think, I think the, for the mad scientists and all of us, I think it's also kind of fun because now you actually have an apples to apples where you can actually do some comparison, and you don't have any noise from like, hey, this bullet's a different weight that's also at work here. So there's different energy or different ballistics. It's like, no, this is the same all right. ballistically and the same energy-wise. Yeah. But it's construction, and so now maybe there's an opportunity to for people to be even maybe more educated as yep. to uh, what does the bullet construction yeah. actually do? How does it create some differences in performance? Absolutely. So, like, I mean, you, you Sean, on the like shooter side, more are you mostly shooting match, or always shooting match, or is there like a world where you always, dip in? always, always? Sh but what's interesting is when I would need things for projects, and mm -hmm. I would call Horny, call Seth. He was really good about getting stuff out. Yeah. Uh, if they didn't have M, he would be like, let me send you X because you don't realize how close these are to being the same yeah. thing. And it's weird to me, you know, as a match shooter, um, the hunting bullet thing, right? Because it's like, oh, what am I really getting? Like, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Um, I, and I always felt like it was less accurate from an overall standpoint, probably because it's shot different, differently in different guns. Yeah. But I would shoot the X stuff and... Yeah, it's, it's still shooting out, mm -hmm. you know, 11, 1,200 yards, all that type of stuff, still getting the sub-minute groups out of, you know, match rifles, heavy guns. Yeah. So, yeah, it's So in your, in your go-to caliber right now, and, like, you know, shooting, talking about match and big heavy guns, like, what is your current go-to caliber? I'm a big six Creedmoor fan. Just all I, low recoil, flies well, does well in the wind, gets yeah, there mm -hmm. fast. You know that again, that recoil thing. So it's just yeah, we one that I really took. Now it can be a finicky round, though, in the build of your rifle. Um, six five Creedmoor. I get. I do a lot of things in that just because it's like the it's like the the new three hundred eight. <laughs> I know people hate, but look, it's the yeah. standard. Yeah. And here's the thing I'll say, and I'll give Hornady a solid plug, and I tell everyone this anyway: one hundred forty grain ELDM. In a 6.5 Creedmoor, one and eight twist, assume you got that twist. Mm -hmm. If your rifle won't shoot that, there's something wrong with your rifle. Yep. Because it's, like it's, it's just the gold really standard. Really. It just <laughs> is. Yeah. You know, if we want to go back, what, what did you just say? This is like a 168. Yeah, gold, yeah, yeah. The gold medal match. Yeah. You will yeah. say that. That 308, that was the standard, right? Like yeah, you right. buy this ammo if you buy 308. A 6.5 Creedmoor is the 140 ELDM. So, what is the percentage on the manufacturing side? Like, do you all sell? A lot more 140s or a lot more 143s, or is it? I mean, without knowing the numbers exactly, I'd say ballpark it's 50 50. Oh. I just, I'm more familiar with like bullet production than actual bullet plant, not on the ammo side. Yeah. So I can tell on a day to day, week to week basis, this many presses are running these bullets at any given time. Yeah. Like we're always running 143s. On, every day, all day. On multiple <laughs> machines. I don't know if I should talk about that much, but same thing with 140s. Yeah, that's it's crazy. like they're always running. You need something for something, They're all. you know they're always running. A lot of stuff's like, yeah, they're on the schedule, but. And you're so right about that being accurate, though. I took that to, we were talking, took that to Africa a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. and it's match match ammo. Mm -hmm. Man, we shot so much stuff. But it was like we shot a um, Steen buck at like 465. I mean, they're so small, but that is, it's so dang accurate. Yeah. You can put it exactly it where you want to go. I haven't missed because of that ammo. Yep. Right. It's, it's not been because it, I didn't hand load it. Right. It's not the case. Dude, back to the six Creedmoor. So, you know, you talk about six Creedmoor, the mm -hmm. GT, the mm -hmm. Mark, all this mm -hmm. stuff around it. Mm -hmm. And I kind of agree with you. I was shocked at how few six Creeds that we ever sell. 
and like or mm. make them and how That's hard they are for us to sell. I don't know why that is, because I mean we shot mule deer with the 103s and it was awesome. Yeah, I mean great. Yep. And uh, but we're like, oh, this is gonna be this is gonna be big. So we built up a couple yep. guns, and it's like the six creeds for us. 28 Nozzer, which you guys have successfully killed, in my opinion. <laughs> and the, the yep. 300 WSM, all like calibers I love, but it's just, it can't, we can't hardly give them away. It's weird. Yeah, I think I've listened to too many people say you can't do certain things with certain things. Mm-hmm. And it's because as a, ma- as a match rifle shooter shooting at steel, I don't know the hunting thing to certain extents, right? Yeah. So I can't really speak to that. I told you when I went to Africa to hunt, I went wind mag on everything. Yeah. Wind mag's going to kill it. Yep. You know what I mean? Um, so now that I know, six could have done, is that? Uh-oh. Somebody's phone. That's you. That's you. <laughs> six, six Creedmoor would do a lot of stuff yeah. that I didn't yeah. think it was capable of, but because it was six, right, yeah. I wouldn't do it. Like, oh, well, it's only 103 grain. And, and yeah. now, again, 80 grains – is smashing yeah. stuff. One of the things I think is interesting is you talk a little bit about, we're flipping back and forth between talking about the precision world yeah. and, and the hunting world. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that I've seen in, in my own like shooting journey is starting from like the big belted magnum, like that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Seven rim mag for me was what I was, mm-hmm. was I was shooting growing up and moving down to smaller stuff. Yeah. Right. And, and what I've found is that though the, the benefit of the precision world, like how it, the way it can teach you to handle your rifle to shoot from different positions absolutely increases your skill because there, there's there's trade-offs right so what you're trading off with power versus the smaller rounds you're getting precision yeah and it's it's that dynamic so basically with the power you're overcoming maybe marginal shot placement or bad angle or mm-hmm. not understanding the anatomy mm-hmm. of what you're hunting sure and when you start adding that precision factor and you know how to handle your weapon you treat it like a tool you yep. know how to handle it well yep and you understand what you're going after all of a sudden doors open Yes. And, and, and the comments about you can't do this with, you know, X, Y, Z, become more a reflection of individual shooter. Yeah. Right. Like shooter skill yeah. can't right. do this. Exactly. Which I think is a whole different world and actually creates a scenario for people to see how you can go from one to the other. So that's interesting because thankfully I get to go on several hunts a year. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'll hunt with people that are part of whatever animal foundation. They do that conservation. Mm-hmm. like So they do this all the time. Yep. All the time. And I come in so inexperienced, so I don't feel comfortable. But you, know, I show up to shoot. Yep. Mm-hmm. My gun is true to 1,000 yards. It's in my Kestrel. It's in my rangefinder. It's on my armband. Right? And I'm ready. I don't care yep. where they say yeah. the distance. I don't. It doesn't even factor in my head. And then, But I'll talk to some of the other people there that do this all the time. I'm like, oh, I don't even know, 275. I wasn't really comfortable. I'm like, what? Yeah, yeah. You weren't comfortable at 275. Like, I was expecting 750. Let's right. get it on, right? <laughs> right. Like, right out of the gate. <laughs> yeah. So that's kind of that difference. Yeah. I come to shoot. I'm not the best hunter yet. I'm learning more, but I come prepared to shoot the rifle. I think it's a really interesting approach. I know we were talking earlier yeah. this week that I really appreciate. You are talking about the learning experience. Mm-hmm. So I think it's, like, super cool to see you as, like, an accomplished shooter and then, like, looking at it that way, right? Like, I think there's just on the hunting side – it's it's interesting because it almost frees you up to really learn more about mm-hmm. hunting. That's that's kind of right. what I've noticed. It's like, oh, well, if I'm worried all the time about yeah. this and shooting, is my gear good? So am I yeah. going to hit this? And you take a guy to a stand, it's exactly right. Okay, here's a deer at 100 yards with a 3 by 9 and I, am I comfortable? And it becomes becomes like worrisome if I can actually make the shot yeah. versus enjoying the yeah. process. Yeah. You know? yeah. And I think that's really, really good. And I think you're starting to see, but because of that, it's interesting, we're starting to see so much of, and it's weird to see like, does the hunting world influence the precision world or really mm-hmm. how much the precision world is influencing like stock yeah. design, you know, yeah. our corrals, like, you know, what we're having to incorporate into precision mm-hmm. hunting rifles. It's like there's starting to be a really, a really unique merge there. Um, definitely the precision and specifically competition space has influenced everything, yep. whether it's hunting, whether it's military and LE, it's really been that huge trickle-down effect. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the one thing I did at Athlon is I ran Ballistic Precision Magazine, and I did their video series. Um, and we wanted to come up with a concept on Precision Magazines back in 2014. We couldn't get publishers to bite. Wow. And we were like, let's do, let's do a magazine called Bolt Gun. Oh. For three years, they told us no. 
there was a couple guys in there that we were like, this is going to be the next thing. Yeah. Let's get ahead of the curve. <laughs> Nobody would do it. They wouldn't put the money into it's it. Poor boat gun guys. We yeah. get the last So, the, and <laughs> you watch, and I don't do a whole bunch of competitions. I might shoot a couple a year, but yeah. I know so many people in the space, great instructors, great shooters, friends of mine, that type of thing. So you go to classes and you shoot with these people and you learn all these different things. And now it's, I hate to say this, and it feels awful to say, shooting prone is almost forbidden anymore. Now, I don't like that necessarily because I always want to be in the most stable position, and prone yep. is it. Yep. But if you can't hop up on a tripod anymore these days and shoot at least solidly to 500 yards, people kind of frown upon you now a little yep. bit, and it's, it's, it's kind of uncomfortable. Yep. You know what well, I'm saying? What, you know, we were talking earlier. It's like for me, I've never, you know, even being in the gun industry and being able to build whatever, do whatever. Like I've been almost uh, discouraged in jumping into the community. Sure. Because it's like, oh man, I don't know. It's like, where is the standard? What do I got to know before I show up at the at the range that day? That's always the scary thing, right? Because then you don't. Yeah. I don't want to be like, oh, Horizon guy shows up and doesn't know what he's doing. I, mean, right. I literally don't understand the format. Well, right? but that's it, right? Like yeah. the Horizon guy shows up, or that guy's supposed to be a rider and he shows up. Can I tell you, if I go to a true, even if it's a local match, but if I go to a true two day match, there's going to be about 12, 13 year old girls that are going to whoop me up and down. <laughs> Seriously, yeah. like I won't even be in their category. And yeah. and why? Well, I can press a trigger well enough. I can do certain things well enough. But can I fold my body up into the positions yeah. and get that stability yeah. right. and that calmness that they can? Nope. Yeah. I can't compete, man. And, and they can do it. And good for them. All right, so I have to ask this now. Come, come back around. On the hunting side. Mm -hmm. So, obviously – confident shooter and like you know that part is like eh, boom it's on it target so do you still get a little bit of buck fever or like oh my gosh it's an animal versus like it's steel or is it like <laughs> are you you psych yourself out and it's just trigger punch it's such a good question i'm a I I'm gonna be honest. I don't get. I don't get the fever. Really? No, because I show Dude, I up. I was even shaking, watching, waiting for you to shoot. I show up to shoot. <laughs> I show up to shoot. Yeah. So, yeah. Like my mule deer hunt last year, we, we see the deer. Here's my. Pro it's the same, dude. I get out hearing protection. I always put in plugs. Like, but that's part of my. I'm not going to rush for the animal and change anything. So I get out. I do this. I check these things. I check my arm bed, and I'm talking to the person if they're spotting. What, what's the range? What's dope? That's. I'm focused on getting my dope. You know, getting in position stability. I don't care about the animal. Yeah. The animal's. A, it's just a target. And if it goes away, there'll be another target. Yeah. So. I come to shoot. That's it. So I don't get the I don't get that buck fever. See, for me, it's I've, I've learned to, to cite myself and process it and get yeah. in the process. But it's it's the last little bit, right? So I've I checked it, I've dialed it, I've ranged it again. Mm -hmm. Camera's running. Mm -hmm. Here we go. <laughs> the camera. Oh my gosh! Now we're really <laughs> now going we're to do this yeah. thing. Yeah. That's when I if I have got to do that quick. Yeah. Or I lose it. I guess yeah. one of the cool things <laughs> that uh, the last couple of days, especially you know last night when we were all in a bigger group uh, hunting, that I noticed is like your routine. So one of the things you growing up, we hunt a lot of times solo. You're gonna stand by yourself, but sometimes you miss out on like there is like real fun in hunting like with buddies, like pair system. And one of the things that I thought was really cool, especially I know you've been hunting before, but hunting whitetail down here is just the communication mm -hmm. that you can have. You know, sometimes mm -hmm. people are totally silent, and for a lot of the stuff like you can still communicate. Yeah. But hearing the communication as we're all going back and forth, there are several times where we're all you know. Yeah, comparing ranges, making sure we've got it. We got like one shooter and everybody kind of playing a role, and I think that's one of the cool things about the hunting community um, that I that I like. But I really enjoyed, uh, you know, when you were on the gun, the communication you had with the spotters was really cool. Yeah, so that was that was a fun experience for me. But it is interesting hunting with an, and no knock to anybody yeah. who's like not experienced in the shooting world. Yeah. But it's it is different. And I was texting my, my wife and I were talking last night. She's like, how is it? I'm like, it is so different to hunt with people who are confident shooters. Like even this morning, like, you know, lining up to shoot at Havelina at 700 yards, right? And so it's like, okay, we're going to do this. Yeah. And it's not like, here's a gun. Let me check your bipod. Let me, it's like, next time I, I look to get my camera and Ryan's like prone, down, down dialed it. And it's yeah. just boom, boom, boom. Yeah. And yeah. It's a little bit different world. So I'm, I'm uh, you know, it's, it's encouraging because I'm really working. I've got an 11 year old boy and I'm really working on him like to get to that confidence factor because I don't know about you guys, but for me growing up, it was uh, the 30 out of six 
And this was a terrible idea. I don't know what my parents were thinking. It was like 30 out <laughs> six, the Ruger, the skeleton stock, the lightweight. Oh, you good know, night. Three by nine loophole scope with not the clicks, but the tension, right? Yeah. But the same year, I got a reloading kit, RCBS, the whole mill deal, powder, the whole thing. <laughs> My, from my grandparents. Nobody in my family reloaded. <laughs> what do I do? <laughs> Open that manual up and like max load. Max oh, load yeah. Right there. Right there. <laughs> and I still have a scope scar. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Load, all right. So, uh, and, you know, it's like, uh, the you know, five pound trigger or whatever. I mean, it's just, it's the, thing, the game's changed. Man. Well, that's the same thing. I mean, I started off on a, I mentioned seven rim mag and a, the uh, ADL plastic stock. Yeah. Man, that that sucker was it. It thumped a little bit, right? But that's what you. But that's what you did, right? Yeah. So well, I'll tell you on your say your son's eleven. Yes. As a guy that's that has gone through long range shooting, probably backwards as far as when I started versus the end point that I wanted that where Mm -hmm. I am now. um, I would suggest starting him out spotting. Mm. That's where I learned how to shoot was spotting. That's good. That's exactly, you know, you can press the trigger, you can do those things and hit. But once you start seeing bullets fly, watching trace some versus something you told the person to do, and you know they're doing it, and then what you see out in the field, that's where my confidence came from. Yeah. Because then I could tell a person, hey, come up, you know, you know I'm a mill guy. I need to come over half mill. No, I'm like the odd But yeah, two, last two mills this <laughs> way, a mill and a half here, that – confidence came from spotting because i'd go shooting with guys that were better than me and they're like okay spot for me and i'd be like okay yeah. okay <laughs> and they press the trigger and miss and i'd be like yeah <laughs> um <laughs> yeah you know three <laughs> inches no confidence yeah right but when i was on the gun they'd be like hey dude dial here move this hold here and you'd hit and i'm yeah. like i want to do that that's what changed my game on the rifle. That's awesome. Yeah. That's good feedback. So we were talking about Vapor Trail a little bit earlier. Mm-hmm. What – so technical side, and maybe maybe yeah. I'm asking this, and maybe I should know this. Why do you get Vapor – why do you see Vapor Trail sometimes? I know, like, now like, it's the hot thing. Like, give me a gum and I can watch Vapor Trail so I can read wind or whatever on the precision side. Like, how do you get to see it more? Or is there a setting in your scope? Or, like, does a certain bullet do it more than others? Like, what's the, what's the science behind it? That on the bullet side. That's a that's a lot going into that. Uh, that's why I ask. I'm really <laughs> a lot of it's environmental. <laughs> like I catch I'm like, I'm glad you looked over there. Yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm not the leading authority on this topic, but the overall thing that's going on, you're just displacing air, right? Okay. As that bullet's spinning, the air is going to travel around it, so it's like environmentally driven. If you got humidity and how what the angle of the sun is. Through the scope, yep. it's a big thing. Yep, interesting. Is uh, I was thinking about this topic earlier too. It was kind of on the same line. The new ELD VTs, their guys were talking about it. Uh, they were shooting it, whatever, twelve hundred yards, doing a bunch of radar early stuff. And I wasn't there, so it was just secondhand. But they were talking about how those look different on a trace compared to ELD match. Oh, that's weird. They think almost like it stabled out quicker. Like you got a little wobble, a little wobble out of the muzzle. And they could almost see, like, uh, the base of the bullet, the sun reflecting off the base of the bullet, plain as day going down range. Oh, that's wild. Oh, that's like crazy. a little, huh. like a little coin. Interesting. Oh. So it's dependent, and that's just so that situation that so day. So theorize why that is. Uh, is it just because where the weight is in that Yeah, bullet? it's a CG compared to center of pressure thing. Huh. It's but well, it's all is like that such, that scenario that day shooting that way due east and you got the sun at a certain angle and so it's not always going to be the same. Here, you're here in the sun here. <laughs> it's scripted. Well, there's obviously the atmospherics piece, and I don't know. I know it's a certain amount of humidity in the air, you know, that type of thing. Yeah. But one of the big things is um, being directly behind the shooter, yeah. right behind the shooter in that line, yep. and making sure you got enough optic in the – called max ordinate when it flies yep. because you can miss it right like it's mm-hmm. coming out up through it over it and then back down and you may never see it yep. but if you get that right you'll watch the whole thing so yep. Yep. whatever whatever the weather conditions are get right behind the person that makes a huge difference so it's, you make, that's a great point you make because i know this morning we were lined up on on that javelina you know i think i was set up right behind mm-hmm. right behind you when you were laying prone yeah but one of the things that really made a huge difference was we didn't it didn't center the javelina like 
in the middle of the spotting scope, mm -hmm. put it like six o'clock. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, and, and and it's six yes. o'clock, so it's still in there. You can still see it, but right? you're seeing the bullet. But what winds up happening is you, then you're able to see yeah. a, a huge chunk of the yeah. trace. Yep. And so exactly. we had a good trace this morning on on those shots. And I mean, yeah, it does. It kind of surprised yesterday. It didn't seem at the range. It didn't seem as good. We had like humid day, and I expected to see more. And I guess it, maybe the sun just wasn't there. Like. To me, and it made just my eyes yesterday. It felt like it was just a wide blob versus mm -hmm. like here is the trail. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, was that in the afternoon when we were shooting, or yeah. the morning? It was like early afternoon, yeah. but I okay. think it was also windy. And so I know, yeah. I know at least on my yeah. end, I didn't have the stability on the spotting scope yeah, just to, like to see it like compared to what we had this morning. Yeah. 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 So, all right. So did you mentioned VT yeah. bullets. I want to know, like we're in yeah. twenty-two Creed more. We're getting as soon as this. Here's the arc. Okay, so now, now all of a sudden we've got the AR Predator guys, and then we get the Bolt Gun Predator yeah. guys, and we got them all like throwing trash at each other, right? It's great, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so, but the question is now, now it's well, I'm going to take the 64 VT, and I'm just going to juice it up in the Creedmoor. Now, talk to us like smart thing, not smart thing. Like if this is the, <laughs> this is a great Creedmoor bullet, or really this is an Arc bullet. Like what what is the VT yeah. going to be? Well, I mean, you, people are going to do that. Yeah. They're going to juice it up because, oh, it's a lighter <laughs> bullet, and there's higher BC, and, okay, yeah, might as well just juice it up. But it was designed for a 22 arc. Uh, so what's too much? Like, I don't know. I guess if you don't blow bullets up, it's not too much. See, and that's oh, it's good to hear. That's kind of yeah. where, <laughs> where my line ends up being, but it's like the blowing up bullets is in, out, and I want to – I'll clarify this once on podcast. I want you to clarify what that means because people hear like, "Oh my God, you're blowing stuff up!" Like it's a weird thing in the mind, but it's not like you're not exploding something in the gun. It's, right. it's a very weird thing so to it, watch a bullet blow up. So it's describe like what is happening and how do you see it? Like how do I know? Like, hey, I'm blowing up bullets. Uh, either, I mean, you can blow it up right out of the muzzle, or it could be 100 yards down range, or anywhere in between. Like uh, you'll see, if you're shooting paper, you can sometimes see evidence of it starting and not completely coming apart. Basically, the engraving of the rifling is shearing that jacket clean off the projectile, separating it from the core. And then when you get little half moon smileys on paper, it's like the, there's some residual residual oil inside a lead core projectile just from manufacturing process. That's always going to be there. And the theory is. That's getting so hot, you're boiling, basically bringing that to a, a vapor state on the inside of a bullet, and you're oh, s s creating a layer in between the lead and the copper, and the jacket's not thick enough in the right places, or your rifling's rough, or what bore condition is the biggest variable there. Huh. Hmm. So, so, it's, so it's not just pure over rotation then, right? There's something that, helping it. That is okay. that is the catalyst that wow. brings okay. it to See, light. That's but what I was thinking. That's what I was going to ask. Barrel condition is by far the most because we've had some issues with huh. customers having issues with certain bullets, and we try to repeat that and replicate it with these same lot of bullets, and can't we can't get it to happen? Huh. Say, so, hey, you send me your barrel, and yeah, okay, it happens every shot or whatever the case may be, every ten shots. Have y'all noticed anything Weird. with like the the depths? Or the heights of the lands and grooves, like yes. that relationship. Yes. That, uh, so is four groove versus five groove. Okay. Uh, yeah. So which what, yeah, what's the more, more grooves <laughs> make fours, it worse or four is less worse? Like, okay, so fewer grooves makes it four is worse. Interesting. What about three over five? I, three and five, I'm sure, are similar, but I don't know the guys shot a lot so of threes. Is it, so it's it's even groove. odd thing? It's the opposing like, grooves. Interesting. Okay. Interesting. Huh. So basically, you're just. Anytime, so you've got, I'm going to see if I can layman turn this back. So you've got gas on the inside creating pressure between the lead core and the the brat or the or copper on the outside. And then now we've got a bad barrel or a bad spot or something that creates a weak spot in the jacket, and now the gas is trying to escape that weak spot, and all of a sudden it rips apart? Generally, and this is all theory, right? I, we, we can't even, we try to catch bullet in flight as as it's coming apart on high speed. What are the odds of that happening? It's not going to happen. <laughs> yeah. Like, we try to catch bullets in flight on high speed, and your frame is so small that you're even shooting through. You're shooting in a oh, vertical yeah. regime yeah. of this, like an inch and a half, try to get a bullet oh, within a few frames on high speed. Huh. And trying to do that with, with bullets that are coming apart, and you got a really expensive camera right in there. And like, well, 
True. So I guess it's not even, worth I doing that. Even odd groove thing. So like with the even grooves, you know, they're so it's going to engrave and like you're going to get more yep. compression because there's no there's no hollow on the opposite side oh, to like relieve that. a little bit of that pressure. So maybe you're just weakening the jacket to the point yeah. where it's, that's the that's failure. The, yeah, that's okay. the theory. Well, I'm also a keep it simple guy. I like yeah. not the sm- I like easy things. Yeah. Yeah. You can only spin something so fast, by the way. Yep. Yep. No matter what it is, yep. right? And then there's just a there's just a limit to it. Yep. You can only spin your wheel on your on your car yep. so fast. Yep. So yep. yeah, there has to be a limit. I think, I think we were talking yesterday. Uh, you have to keep them around three hundred thousand RPM. Yeah, that's kind of number. Yeah, I think that's even what customer service tells guys. Like if you're up around that three hundred thousand mark for RPMs. And you're having issues. Well, well, first thing, back off a little bit. I mean, if if you can, <laughs> you can always back off. Yeah. But well, and I'm, to be honest, I've only I think I think I've only seen it once, maybe twice. Early, early on, when it's like, and it wasn't even twenty two cream. We're like, hey, what about the, so people are saying twenty two two eighty four cream? Okay, yeah, let's go. And then you know there was like, <laughs> or I've seen there's some stuff that people we didn't do it, it was like looking at you know uh, just big big twenty twos, mm-hmm. and uh, it was like. You shot, and it was kind of like, like it was just like a weird, almost like, poof, and then crud hit the target. Yep. Like, not really, like, anything hit the target. And you're like, yeah. there's no like way I missed 20 that. yards out of the muzzle, that thing's just a yeah. puff of dust. But so so it's, a, a, it's, a function, it's a function of your twist and your velocity, right, basically, is that that's where your RPMs yeah. are coming from. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's twist and velocity that there's nothing else. I mean, it's just a simple equation there. Yeah, yeah so so for the guys out there that are, that are going to hot rod – Right, yeah. Creed more, and they're gonna they're gonna put the VT in there, right? Do, so that's that's math. a starting point. Like, do the math, right? Take what, no time, right? It's a it's a known formula. Do the yeah. we've done a podcast on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Go so, back and watch the Hornady podcast yeah. with us, and we talk exactly on how to calculate. Plug in your numbers, yep. right? Yeah. Make sure you're not gonna blow the thing up before you go spend all your time and effort and money yeah. reloading yeah. the thing and figure out the sweet spot, right? Yeah, and then go have fun. But I'm guessing you're gonna say, don't shoot deer with that, with the ELD VTs. Yeah, <laughs> no. I would say, I could pretty much say as a company, we would not recommend that. <laughs> but like, so in, in your world on the steel side, right? So we were talking yesterday, which I thought was also in my head. I was like, oh, this is kind of interesting. I mean, I've, I've heard it, but I never like thought about it, was, you know, splash. You're talking about like, how important can I, you know, see splash. Yeah. So then I started thinking, I'm like, well, that's why I asked the question earlier about the X's. I'm like, okay, what, what allows you to see splash better? Is it he- just heavier bullets? Is it bullet construction? Like... You know, when you're picking a, a bullet to see impact, is there a bullet selection there, or is it keep it simple and whatever shoots the best in the gun? So I recently had this discussion with someone that knows a lot more about this than me, but he was telling me that some of the higher-end competitive guys are taking six, I don't know if they're GTs or Dashers, yeah. BRs, in that world. Obviously, everybody's shooting sixes. But they were backing the speeds down to, I want to say, the high 28s mm. so that they could see – well, it's consistent, but they're seeing the bullet's not going so fast for that they can really press the trigger, be ready to see where I'm missing. So you're shooting at, let's say you're shooting at four or 500 yard targets. If that thing's going really fast, you don't know where you missed. Mm-hmm. And depending on how a match is set up, you may be shooting at a target that's kind of free floating. So if you miss over the top, you don't know if you missed high or low because it's splashing somewhere else in the background just to throw right. you off. I know we had that yesterday. So, yeah. I could yeah. swore we were hitting left. And well, it exactly. Right. So yeah. these, the, the guys that are, the people that are really good at this, they're seeing their misses and their impacts and they're making constant adjustments the whole time. And it's just a consistent, obviously there's consistency in the ammo, but they're not running it as fast as they can, keeping recoil down and they're watching. And when you can make those corrections quickly, that's that's time on the clock. Now, if you're shooting, you know, let's say you're shooting six five Creedmoor with full load one forties, there's the recoil, right? So yeah. I press the trigger. It takes me a second to kind of mm-hmm. get back. So I saw a splash, but where exactly was that splash? Because my optics now off, and I need to try to measure. Oh, I was I was three tenths of a mil off this yeah. way. Right. That's where that really starts to make a difference. So you think that you, you think I mean six or so popular. You think that we'll see any chance that. 22 creeds work into that world for any particular reason? Oh, absolutely. So? Now, uh, what I don't know is what category yeah. it would fall under. Uh, it, I assume it'd be open because tactical division is 308 and 223. Yep. So this yeah. is a 22, so it's going to fall in the open. So then it would be yeah. against all the sixes, sixes and stuff. Yeah. But I mean, if it's making the velocity, yeah, 
I don't see why it wouldn't. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. It's it's if people will find that it has uh, a recoil advantage for what you're getting yeah. because it's so, going to be so close to the sixes. Yep. If there's no benefit on the um, recoil end, why would you switch? That's a, that's a good point. I would like to see right? side yeah. tension. I'd love to go look at you know Jim's uh, the backfire guy's uh, recoil chart on the six yeah. versus the twenty two yeah. that he just did. I think that would be interesting to know. All right, so uh, we're going to couple couple sections here before we wrap up. Um, so you're talking about on the fly adjustability. I wrote that down. This Garmin chronograph. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get me started. <laughs> that thing is awesome. It's awesome. So I mean, I was honestly, I'm like, I don't want to hear about it. Because we have two labs <laughs> and we have all the gear, and I don't want to change anything. But things pretty sweet. It's beyond sweet. Uh, what do you say? It's one of those products that somebody got right. Yeah. Uh, are there some improvements? Or maybe, but I don't know what they are because it just depends on what you're currently doing. Yeah. And if you're using a lab radar or you're using a magneto speed, you're trying to get velocities, right? Yeah. You're trying to show up. And get the velocities as rapidly as possible, meaning yep. minimal setup time. Seven, eight, nine minutes is a long time to set this portion up so that I can then start pressing triggers. Yep. And the Garmin allows me to do that in 25 seconds. Yeah. Right? Well, so it, I'm behind already just getting the gun ready. I couldn't believe it because we, we struggle with my Thunder Bees. We struggle so much on getting loud. Oh, there's that. To yeah. Go, right? yeah. 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 And so the mic. Yeah. We shot, and we could have counted wrong. I don't know. But it, we shot 32 shots based yeah. on the brass we picked up, and the chronograph had 31 on it. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I, mean, I mean, we've used the, the lab radar yeah. without the trigger, and obviously that's, you know, the reality is yeah, people who've had those things, it, it's hard. Yeah. And we, we've got the triggers, so right, we've used the triggers, and, and that, mm -hmm. it's a world of difference with the lab radar, but, but it is nothing compared to no. that garden right, In my opinion, the lab was a big jump from the magneto speed. Like, I, I love going to I went that. backwards, though. Oh. I went from the lab radar back mm. to a magneto speed. Um, everyone's got their quirks, right? And here's the problem. You show up at lab radar, and I've got eight rounds of this precious ammo. <laughs> and I missed four of them, right? Like, oh. <laughs> I got to come up with some kind of velocity, some kind of average. We may have missed one yesterday in the Garmin, but I think because the way it was positioned, it just may have moved because yeah. it will shut itself off if it moves because yeah. of the radar. Oh, it has yeah. to shut itself off so you don't fry yourself yep. up, right? Yeah. Um, and then magneto speed was always, I got to strap it to this or strap it to that. So I bought the Arca Rail adapter, which is great, but yeah. then it's only good for my Arca Rail guns. Yep. Yeah. So it's not that it was So it's this quirkiness yeah. that just doesn't happen with the Garmin. Yeah, life changing, I, life changing. I couldn't go back to the magneto speed because I shot mine off. Which oh. is when I went to lab. Yeah. <laughs> so, I've so done. It makes it hard. I may have yeah. scraped mine once or twice. It's, it's, it's like I got the little rod. Out yeah, there, I, know, I, going, I know. Oh, you know. Yep. Well, you know, and the thing for us is that I would say I don't know that we've shot much of the Creedmoor like without a, without a suppressor. No, like because we're shooting <laughs> short. Part of the advantage of the short barrel is so that we can use the suppressor mm -hmm. because. Frankly, like if you're if you're out there hunting right now, especially we talked earlier about you know your boy and and, mm -hmm. and my, my kids are in the same boat. You, you got to be if you're not running a suppressor on your hunting rig, like yeah. and you're missing out. You really are. And 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 but that makes it hard to get these speeds unless you got that Garmin, and then it's not so hard after all. Yeah, that microphone on the lab radar that setup is not. No, not. I mean, good. we got the trigger to overcome it. Yeah, but you know the trigger, and the trigger is good. But you know what you run into with the trigger is now I get a reading. And then I cycle my bolt, and I get another reading. Oh, because I got gotcha. you. the bolt and that magnet. So it's, it's we trade one problem for a different problem. Right. And at the end of the day, your Garmin was, like, set up. I mean, we turned around, and it was ready to How roll. many rounds did we run? How many different oh setups God. did we just know, but just a couple buttons press, put it down? We changed down. guns. We changed, yeah. like, yeah. shooters. And, and I'll tell you what the convincing yeah. part to me was. I'm like, this is really, really cool. But if it's, and I, I, I'm behind you working my Kestrel, you know, every time you're mm -hmm. shooting, so I'm like working it versus what we're seeing. It's mm -hmm. so fast set up. Yeah. But then when you show me it, like, oh, look, it's on my phone. Yeah. I'm like, what the heck? Yeah, dude. Okay, take it's my game money. Game changer. <laughs> few th you know, we hear game changer a lot in this yeah. industry. This is a game changer, yeah. 100%. So what I want to know, and I don't know if, it's, if anybody knows or can comment, send me an email. You may know this. Will it Bluetooth from, so it goes to your phone, will it Bluetooth to the watch? Like, so can I set it up, shoot, and get live oh. data change with the watch? 
uh, with the so, Garmin watch. Yeah, yeah. I, you know what? I don't know that now. I'd have to ask my person inside. You need to find that out because if but it does, I won't bolt. I wanna, I wanna <laughs> yeah, say, I wanna say maybe I heard that's a possibility, yeah. but I. That's See, a good question. That's what, I need to find out. That's what's kept me out of the watch deal. Right. But I'm like, man, okay, now all of a sudden, yeah. like this and that, like yeah. it's, yeah. yeah. You don't need anything. I don't know. I've wow. never. I've got the watch here. The ballistics got the applied well, ballistics. Cool. I never even thought about afterwards. trying it out. But <laughs> that would be that would be awesome because then you, you could put it right into it and have your solution set up immediately. That's well, that's great. Thinking, think about it. And, and maybe this is overkill, but. If you can put the thing on an Arca and it's on your gun, mm -hmm. and I'm shooting and I'm looking mm -hmm. at my yeah. watch as I'm going, it's yeah. giving me last shot data yep. constantly. It yeah. could be pretty wild. True, so. true. All right, guys. Well, I appreciate uh, it's been fun. So here's what we're gonna do. We we always on our podcast. Now we started very anxious. We used to do a 22 questions uh, or very ambitious, yeah. very yeah, ambitious. Yeah. And anxious, I guess. But we used to do 22 question speed round, right? So oh, here's gosh. Questions. That's a lot of questions. questions. <laughs> That's a lot of questions, right? And so then we paired it down. We're like, dude, let's get this thing to like seven questions, right? Yep. So and we were like, we'll still call it our 22 Creedmoor speed round question. So now with four of us here, so here's what we're going to do. I'm going to pair this down to the two key questions people ask, and then we'll come back around, and we always ask, what is on your horizon? So be ready, ready for that. So what's going on in your life or your business or, um, you know, uh, that's going to be the last question. So think about what's on your horizon. But we're going to start, which is two key questions. Um, I'm going to put a disclaimer up. Okay. Because of my time in, as a freelancer, I always hesitate before I say anything. Okay. Just so you know. Sure. Because... <laughs> There are reputations and manufacturers <laughs> these, and relationships these, these, on the line. I'm just letting you know. These yeah. are easy things. Just letting you know. All right, all right, all right. Because, okay, I'm going to hit you up with the first one. See, I'll show you how easy it is. Ready? <laughs> Here you go. Favorite hunting snack. So this question, I've been keeping up with whatever, and I say this every podcast. I'm keeping up with this list. My goal is at the end of this year, I want to put it all out on the table and rate it. So, <laughs> so what you say matters here. <laughs> oh, man. Favorite hunting snack. Oh. Man, well, I don't do okay. So I would say it's this, it's this uh, trail mix at Walmart, indulgent mix. Okay, it's got like white chocolate chips, Ooh. caramel nuts, raisins, uh, all that type of stuff in it. Like that's a no brainer go to. That's that's it. Perfect indulgent mix from Walmart. There you go. Nice. Walmart got some free pubs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, Ryan, what you taking? Little pieces of candy. Is it junk Is food? It hard candy? No, like chocolate. Like okay. little mini nice. Snickers, there mini we Twix. Go. There we go. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's garbage and it's terrible. But <laughs> while I'm hunting, that it's like man, it, especially sitting in a tree stand all day, like bow hunting whitetails in the Midwest. Like, oh, this is gets to be a drag at points. So That's just, little. Just like, oh yes, I got like, a Milky oh. Way. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> something like that. That's awesome. Uh, Trevor, nice. what you got? So, always have some kind of jerky. Like I like jerky. But the other thing is is a trail mix. Normally, it's, you know, I'm looking for cashews, almonds, and, and craisins. But, but I, a wide variety, but two things are off limits for my trail mix for hunting. No peanuts, no coconut. Someone put the little coconut stuff. I'm just not interested in those. <laughs> Dude, I, I'm not interested in coconut like that. Yeah. I mean, I have no reason to have shredded wax paper in my no. snack. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. And the peanut thing is like, oh, it's not that I don't like them or have any problem with them. It's just that if I'm going to go get trail mix, inevitably when you do that, there's, you know, 60% peanuts. You know, it's like. <laughs> I well, they're cheap. So yeah, raisins. raisins. Raisins comprise 85% yeah. of everything with with other stuff in it. <laughs> that's why I go. That's why I go with the, the craisins, right? The dried cranberries. I don't like craisins. Yeah, All right, so now yeah. on the jerky though, okay. people people are particular about jerky, right? Uh -oh. The first couple episodes, it was. This uh -oh. is funny. The first couple episodes, we, people would say jerky, and like Paul, the savory guys that are cooking for us, who've done a great job. Mm -hmm. But he heard the podcast and brought me like the jerky that this guy was talking oh. about. Cause I'd never heard of it. Yeah. So people have like a weird flavor on jerky. Jerky. So yes, what, so. what jerky? Okay, so so this is it may be it may be a, an out, but it but it's but it's true. Most of the time, make my own jerky. Oh, it's venison. Okay, and and this so this will be a shout out from my from my uncle. Uh, so we have a, a uh, his nick, his nickname is Tuj, and so it's Tuj's rub. There you go. And so we got a little recipe, but it's got a lot of like 
with some cumin, oregano, paprika, chili powder, kind of oh, that, yeah. that vibe going on. All right. Uh, a little bit of a little bit of uh, brown sugar, or we like to swap it out with pimoncia for a little bit of sweetness oh, sure. on. I thought you were going to really say good. Slim Jim. <laughs> I was like, please don't <laughs> no, say Slim no, Jim. Please no, don't. No, I mean, you're definitely <laughs> not. Definitely oh, anything not, homemade is the full legit. But yeah, so we yeah we do, but it's always it's almost always venison. Um, oh. I say almost no, it's always venison yeah. unless it's. Elk. Well, you're gonna have to so. Get your uncle queued up. Make sure he's got his jerky ready for the end of the year. Here we do our big test. Gotcha. No well, I'm pressure. Gonna, I got to make the. I got the recipe already. I just have to. You have to collect the venison. Well, the kids <laughs> love it. So the kids want me to use that the two just rub, not just on like jerky. They want me to use it on like everything. They want it on tacos. They want it on like whatever. Okay. Nice. And so they they've been pestering me, telling me it's it's time to whip up another batch. So <laughs> there we go. I'll, I'll have to bring you some. Awesome. So I'll use it on answer your question. I'm going to throw this one out there. So okay. for me, it's kind of a twofold question, right? So if I'm with my kids, which is the most of the time when I actually yep. have hunting snacks, our family deal, we do two two main things in the stand. One, when we get in, we always do a deer stand prayer, right? So that's yeah, like our, that's yep. our thing. And uh, that's been fun to see do that yep. with my boys. I love that. And then the second thing, Pop-Tarts. It don't matter if it's morning or evening. It's Pop Tarts, all right? <laughs> they love it. Now, I don't like the Pop Tarts so much, but the kids love it. And um, you know, uh, one of the guys on the podcast was talking about snacks like that. And he goes, dude, those kind of snacks, you just got to open them, make just up kidding. as much yeah. noise as possible because they're terrible with the wrapper. So that's, yeah. my kids would say that. Me, I'm a Reese's guy. Give me oh, Reese's yeah. peanut butter cups and give yeah. me the small ones so I can have multiple. Mm-hmm. I don't feel like I have to open it. And exactly. <laughs> so what are you going to say about my my, my, <laughs> <laughs> my last two <laughs> matches? <laughs> I was going to a, a local match and I'm like, you know, by the way, my wife and, and most women are great about snacks. Like, take snacks. And we don't think about that. We just run out and regret it later. So I got smart. I got snacks. I grabbed Pop-Tarts and cashews. And it was the brown sugar Pop-Tarts. Oh, yeah. Okay. You bite into the Pop-Tart, throw in some cashews, and it's like, <laughs> oh, So just yeah. so you know, nice. or walnuts. So oh, yeah. it's a great, like, if you just... Yeah. Going to be gone for five there or six go. hours. Yeah, that's a new one. Just so, so, so you Kellogg's know, Kellogg's needs to mix. Those just so things. you yeah, know, yeah, I'm just go. I'm telling you, it <laughs> works. Well, so you talk about your, your boys and the pop tarts, and it just reminds me. I know you and I've talked about this before because for us, a, a big thing is getting our kids involved, yeah. um, and that's one of the one of the, the golden rules. Or you know, you got a couple golden rules with the kids. You know, I say keep the gun quiet, right? Minimize the recoil, but have fun. Bring great snacks. Bring yes. great snacks. Like, true. And, and true, it, true. not necessarily in that order. Like sometimes bring great snacks yeah. is like thing number one, right? <laughs> and, and it really is. You, you build the fun and, and you let the skill and, and the and the love for it grow from there, right? That's awesome. All right. So here's our, our last speed round question that I'm gonna ask you what's on your horizon. Is there just outside I'm gonna exclude outside the garden, new favorite gear you've seen lately? You're like, oh that's kinda cool. Hmm. And you don't have to explain it, just like I'm looking at this. I think it's kind of neat. Mm. Woo. You're going to have to edit out this lull That's of That's fine. thought process. <laughs> That's fine. Man. It's tough because you took the Garmin out. It is because the Garmin oh, really, really That's did. Man. It's, so really, it's, a no, so it's like on. product of the year, by the okay. way. It really is precision yeah. shooting so product we'll, of the we'll year. The I was figuring if everybody was going to say Garmin. That's why I wanted to throw it out there. <sighs> yeah, you have first or, place or let me flip it back. Is there a product outside of the Garmin that you're looking at, test, like you're going to test, you're like, That's, that could be cool. Um, the Vortex, the laser range finder, mm-hmm. that, yeah. that scope mountable one, I forget the name of it. Yep. Um, that one kind of showed up on the radar. and mm-hmm. I, I'm not always researching stuff because I'm always right. working, so things come out of the blue on me a little bit. Mm-hmm. But just got that in. I'm looking forward to trying that and seeing if there's a – a faster process than yeah. range finding and getting yep. on. So yep. hopefully that's good. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Ryan, you see yeah. anything cool out there lately? I'll give you a freebie here because I don't – my in, initial reaction goes to archery there, so I know we're not talking about that. Not, it's hunting, man. Well, Matthew's lift, their new bow they just launched. I'm all excited about the lift. Okay. But lift. I'm going to have to look at that one. I've is seen it still things. single cam or is it a split limb or something like that, right? Well, they, it's the same limbs as the Phase 4 from last year. Oh, nice. But they white, took a ton of weight out of the riser, so it's super light. Is or, it carbon? or No, it's oh, still okay. aluminum riser. Okay, but, all right. Uh, in the firearm that. space, I need to build, this is all basically freebie for you guys, but lightweight <laughs> action for a lightweight hunting gun. Hmm. 
Mm. What should Hint. I be? Hint. Mm. Hint. Well, that's, but I have Maybe, gone yeah. looking at a bunch of different, what should I build a, that's awesome. a new lightweight <laughs> action on? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I love it. Trippy, what you got? So I'd say, you know, you, you mentioned the, the Vortex laser. So the, the product is not necessarily new. Right. But the Vortex LHT, mm. yep. I, I really, especially, you know, with some of our rifles that we've been taking out testing as we've been getting this lightweight stuff, like big fan of the Vortex. So in, in my family, like we made the call, we're, we're, we all shoot mill and we all shoot Vortex. And I try really hard to shoot either the same reticle or the same family of reticles. It makes, you know, you talked about learning through spotting. But it makes it easier to be consistent communication-wise. Mm. The downside is that I'm running, like, strike eagles on everything, which I love, but they're not <laughs> light scopes. And so it right. feels clunky yeah. to, you know, have this lightweight rifle and, and, and I'm slapping a, a, a strike eagle, which no complaints about performance, but I really want to get my hands on yeah. LHT and put that lightweight scope on it. So that's, that's for me, yeah. I'm going to throw one out, and the reason I keep asking so many questions about the VT is, like, on the 22 Creedmoor side, like, um, to me, that's something I'm looking forward to, hot riding some of those a little bit, seeing what I can get out of them, and then, like, what we can do. And you've seen down here, we have a lot of tags, we've got a lot of opportunities, and so, um, it, your movement's been a little slow this week, but um, come this winter, I'd like to have some of those VTs loaded up in the 22 Creed just to see kind of what we can do or not do with them. He promises to do the math I first promise, and not I blow promise to do the math. Or at least to and, not and call I promise not service. to start with deer. But <laughs> I, I want to shoot a coyote <laughs> or a you know, bobcat or whatever with that at velocity and just see, like, um. what the anchor force is on it. Because, I mean, honestly, that's kind of where we started mm -hmm. the 22 Creed is, you know, coyote competitions, I need to anchor stuff because it's time. Right. And so if I can get something a little flatter that, you know, works on environment, yeah. fur friendly does not matter to me at this point um yeah. so i'm kind of looking forward to seeing what we can do yeah. with that and I, yeah. think, I think the bullet concept is really cool so if you see it in different you know, I know there's a six there's an 80 in the six mil yep. um which i was happy to see that the 80 in the 22 is a little higher bc just selfishly i was like, <laughs> still got it just a little bit <laughs> but that's what i'm looking forward to there so all right so last question I always like to ask people, what is on your horizon? So what you got going on in life and business, um, place you're going hunting next, what, what is on your horizon right now? Hmm. You got well, a lot of stuff going. Got a lot of stuff going. <laughs> um, you know what? I'm going to be honest. I'm, I'm in prayer about that right now. Yeah. What, whatever he needs me to do, go, that's what I'm down for. Awesome, man. Yeah. I mean, I've done this a long time, so every year I kind of reset. You know, like, this year I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that. It's going to be even cooler than last year. So there's always this striving to do more in this space. Yep. Uh, but I stopped, and I'm just like, you know what? I'm going to step back and see what he has planned for me. That's awesome. That's where it is. Awesome. Uh, you got to have some cool projects. I know you can't talk uh, about all of them, but you got to we'll have some cool stuff. stuff. <laughs> I'm big on the muzzleloader thing right now, both in my personal hunting expeditions and even stuff at work. So I don't know why, but muzzleloader's just been exciting for me lately. Cool. So trying to do some new cool stuff there. And we came out with the board driver and the ELDX board driver last year that I think is a game changer on off-the-shelf inline muzzleloaders for what you what it allows you to do uh, range-wise. But... Yeah, a lot going on there and some other cool projects, too. So there's always new there's stuff. Always stuff to long, oh, hey, I like that, stuff to that, be that done. sound of long-range muzzleloader. <clears throat> sounds fun. Yeah, that's so. interesting. What you got? Oh, man. Well, we got lots of stuff going on at, at Horizon <laughs> right now. I mean, with the, the 22 Creedmoor is keeping us busy. Um, you know, so so we've, got, we've got several things coming up that are exciting. Um, I think we talked a little bit about lightweight action earlier. So I think for us, uh, we continue ramping up with all the interest in the 22 yeah. Creedmoor. So just dialing that in, continuing to deliver um, quality. It's so much fun like seeing results from the field and people just, you know, over the moon happy with, with the performance they're getting. Yep. But taking that next step with that, with that Wombat action, mm -hmm. I mean, that's going to be something big for us. Um, you know, I've talked, yeah. you know, about having a little bit of fun wildcat and something, you know, <laughs> something, something 25. We've we're we're we got to figure out which one we're going to go with, but we just want to. Something you know, 25 and a some, wombat. Something 25 and a wombat. <laughs> Cuddly as little death machine, man. That's right. <laughs> that's right. So you know, I'd, I'd say that, you know, without going too far, you know, into the weeds or anything like that, that's, that's kind of what I got going on the horizon. 
Cool, man. For me, I think really um, show season. Yeah. And I, I start looking at, we got this, we got another group coming in hunting like today. Yeah. And then I get home two days and go to Vegas for NFR. And then, um, which is cool because we grew up like uh, ranching and rodeo mm-hmm. and my boys wanting to rope and stuff. And so now I'm like, hey, Horizon, you know, yeah. we, we, we've got a booth there now. And like we've got yeah. Circle Y, the saddle company, and Bedrock's got a booth. And so like I want to encourage because, like, in sports today, like, there's not a – I don't have a guy that my son looks up to and, like, right. follows, right? But in rodeo, there's a couple guys. Um, uh, there's a young man, his name's Riley, um, who's, like, going to NFR as an 18-year-old calf roper, right? And so, I'm like, uh, you know, um, and so yeah. I, the opportunity to go to the Super Bowl of rodeo yeah. uh, and take my boy is going to be pretty cool. And then the, we come right back here for a hunt with Backfire yeah. and then right into another hunt. And then we go DSC, and it's like yeah. so. From here to February, it's a run for Shut the family. Up. So it's like that's what's yeah. on the horizon. I don't know that I always love it, but I'm hoping to take some air at the NFR and enjoy family time. So that's, that's what awesome. I kind of got yeah. there. So, well, cool guys. I appreciate you being on the podcast, guys. Thank you so much for watching this episode of On the Horizon. Be sure and like and subscribe below. Let us know what you think, uh, what topics you like to see, and then. Um, I'm going to throw a thought out here of a trooper put. Be sure when you go out to the stand, always have great snacks. (laughs) Until next time, we'll catch you later.